If you like classic St. Louis wrestling videos, you'll love the new book by Larry Matisic from ECW Press. Wrestling at the Chase, the inside story of Sam Muchnick and the legends of professional wrestling. Available now. What happened behind closed doors in St. Louis? Get Wrestling at the Chase, the book by Larry Matisic now. Available everywhere. It's time for classic St. Louis wrestling. From St. Louis, Missouri, the magic city of wrestling. Action from Wrestling at the Chase and all the superstars of St. Louis. Off the ropes comes Brody. Flying tackle levels the world champion. Over the top. Leapfrog by the world champion. Hip toss and down goes Brody. Ric Flair backing up. Coming for the elbow drop and he misses as Brody rolls away. This is a special edition of Classic St. Louis Wrestling, Flair and Brody, The Hour. Hello, I'm Larry Matisic. On February 11th, 1983 at the Checker Dome in St. Louis, Ric Flair defended the World Heavyweight Championship and Gold Belt against King Kong Brody, one of the greatest matches ever in St. Louis. Our thanks go out to Michael Bocchicchio of HighSpots.com for providing the tape of Flair and Brody, and High Spots does a lot to keep the tradition of wrestling, the history of wrestling alive. Of course, in the history of wrestling, St. Louis has a major spot. All the action, and certainly Flair and Brody, was a classic match. When it's all said and done, in retrospect, and you look back, that was the last big match of the golden era of St. Louis. But in the early 1980s, there was lots of action, some tremendous talent. Let's take a look at some of that first. In fact, let's consider that the preliminaries before we get to the main event of Flair and Brody. Here we go with the preliminaries on Classic St. Louis Wrestling, the special edition. From Duluth, Minnesota, weighing 230 pounds, Billy Howard. From Indianapolis, Indiana, weighing 236 pounds, Spike Hubert, referee Ed Warren. The matches on this edition of Wrestling at the Chase were taped before Nature Boy Ric Flair won the World Heavyweight Championship. Flair became the owner of the gold belt by beating Dusty Rhodes in Kansas City Thursday, September 17th. A special look at how Flair defeated Rhodes is coming up later on today's program. Again, he's in the hair of Spike Huber and Ed Warren balls out Billy Howard. I don't know if Warren got a good look at what Howard did. He has a pretty good suspicion of what happened, though, and more or less to forewarn against any problem with Howard, he really got on Howard. Head scissors by Spike. Once more, a good move by the son-in-law of Dick the Bruiser. It's not a strangle. The referee checked that. Howard puts his foot on the bottom rope and gets a clean break from Spike Huber. Spike has really built himself up when he first started in professional wrestling a few years ago. He was probably a good 20, 25 pounds lighter, but religious work on the weights, hard training, and Spike is really a very powerful young man. He shows it right there as he leans into the wrist lock on Billy Howard. Howard reaching up for the hair of Huber. Warren caught him and made him stop pulling the hair of Spike. Huber really leaning in with that wrist lock, punishing the arm of Billy Howard. Spike has the strength to do that. Spike leaning into it now, putting pressure back even underneath the shoulder. He's hurting that shoulder of Howard as well as the wrist and arm. Look at Spike getting underneath there, underneath that shoulder. Howard reaches into the chin. Howard complaining that his hair was being pulled. Warren checks it. Howard ducks beneath Huber. Body slam. Huber kicks out. Arm drag by Spike Huber. Good move, and the crowd liked it. Well, I'll tell you, you cannot help but like Spike Huber. He has to be one of the original 110% guys. He never gives less than his best total effort in any match. It doesn't matter who the opponent is, if Spike's giving away 100 pounds or if he's at even weight. This guy will go headlong into a concrete wall. He backs up from nobody. All the spunk and fire in the world. And how else could it be? He has to train with Dick the Bruiser. Spike doesn't try. Dick slaps him around a little bit. So you know, too, that from that type of training, Huber can handle a rough going. And if we don't like him, Dick the Bruiser will be over here. Mickey Garagiola knows full well that you don't want Dick the Bruiser upset with you when you're inside the ring with him. He believes in King of the Hill. <laughs> and that ring is his. 
Oh, a punch right into the eye of Spike Huber. Right on the bone over the eye, and already a little mouse farming on Spike Huber's eye from where Billy Howard popped him. He laid that in there. And Huber, his temper tested right there by Billy Howard. Spike goes to the leg, good move. Leg drop into the calf muscle. Spike Huber with a leg lock on Billy Howard. He hooks the instep, leans back against the ankle. Spike's own knee in the hamstring muscle of Howard. Now Spike steps inside and snaps that hamstring. That hamstring can be cramped very easily. Huber knows it. A couple of those leg snaps and an opponent is bound to be limping around. In this case, the opponent is Billy Howard and he'd like to protect, protect that hamstring if he can. Now Huber forces the leg forward directly back putting more strain once more on the hamstring and right through the knee. Huber spreading it out, almost a type of leg split, except that instead of standing on the other ankle, Huber's standing on the knee of Howard. Spike gets his shoulder against the back of the ankle of Howard. Howard tells referee Ed Warren that Howard will not give up. Oh, Howard gouging the eyes and nose. And Huber has to release the leg split. It's the second time Howard's been up around the eyes of Spike. Huber slammed head first into the top turnbuckle by Howard. Another hard pop to the face from Billy Howard. Warren balls out Howard once more. Howard grabs the hair and Huber's head hits that buckle again. Spike's head and face really taking some punishment at the hands of Billy Howard. Front face lock by Howard. The referee checks that it's not a strangle, and now Huber hooks the head of Howard. They end up in the ropes. One, two, three, Knee lift into the stomach by Howard. Five minutes of elapsed, five minutes left. Huber blocked that attempt to be thrown into the corner, and instead it was Howard who hit the buckle. Spike Huber pounds on the head of Howard. Howard reaches right back out and gouges the face of Huber. Spike having trouble with Billy Howard. Howard nails Huber with an elbow smash. Going for the pin is Billy Howard. Out of one. Huber kicks away, gets those shoulders up, and Howard griping, yelled out in dismay. Oh, Howard went for a body slam. What happened? Flying cross body blocked by Huber. He cradles the leg. Those shoulders are down, and that's it. Beautiful move by Spike Huber, catching Howard with a flying cross body block after Huber had managed to escape from an attempted body slam by Billy Howard. Brilliant move by Spike Huber, the flying cross body block, then a cradle, and Spike Huber's the winner. Here's ring announcer Mickey Garagiola. In five minutes and 50 seconds, a flying body block, the winner, Spike Huber. Welcome to St. Louis Wrestling. This match, an Australian tag team match, a one fall with a 10 minute time limit. Introducing from Orlando, Florida, weighing 236 pounds, Buddy Landau. From Davenport, Iowa, weighing 233 pounds, Max Blue. From El Paso, Texas, weighing 222 pounds, Chava Guerrero. From Houston, Texas, weighing 223 pounds, Tom Pitcher, referee Mark Schreiner, Lee Warren. Chavo Guerrero and Tom Pritchard. That should be a high-flying duel, but they have their hands full against tough Max Blue and cocky Buddy Landell. Pritchard and Landell circle one another. Hip toss by Landell on Pritchard. There have been some hot and heavy moments between these two gentlemen. Pritchard takes a look at Max Blue to make sure he's where he belongs. Get him, Tom Yells. High flying Chavo Guerrero. Landell hoist Pritchard. Big body slam by Buddy Landell. Pritchard tries to straighten out that spine. We'll have to have Cardinal trainer emeritus Bob Bowman 
Take a look at Tommy Pritchard. If he takes a few more of those body slams. Landell not lacking for confidence. Reminds many people of a young Buddy Rogers. Landell twists Pritchard to the ropes, fires a knee into the stomach. Pritchard comes flying. Big backdrop from Buddy Landell. And Landell coming out early in the match and taking command. A forearm smash that was legal. Really, everything Landell's done so far has been legal. Oh, look at Pritchard. He reverses the hip toss. And Landell is slammed by Tommy Pritchard. Arm drag by Pritchard. A second arm drag by Pritchard. Tom Pritchard. One of Mickey Garagiola's favorite wrestlers. And I'll tell you, Mickey Garagiola is not the minority in the greater St. Louis area. A lot of people like this young man. Here comes Chavo Guerrero. Chavo twists the arm around. Side headlock by Landell on Chavo. Landell hits the rope. So does Chavo. They're both flying. Chavo's waiting. Leapfrog over the top. And Landell goes flying. Guerrero goes to the air and brings Landell right over the top. Chavo with a chop, an open hand blow that was legal. Chavo Guerrero drop kick. And now Landell's not quite so cocky. Tag made to Tom Pritchard, and Landell must be wondering what happened. Forearm smashed by Pritchard. Flying bear by Pritchard. Landell's not strutting now. Oh, did you see that leg drop from Pritchard? A lot of guys try to use that, but I don't see too many use it as well as Pritchard. He was as high as the top ring rope. The referees have to run Max Blue out of there. Blue wanting to help his partner who's in trouble. Tom Pritchard started out working in the wrestling office for promoter Paul Bosch in Houston, Texas. He was a gopher. So exactly what it was. He got off school when he was a high school student. He had a driver's license, and he drove Paul Bosch all over Houston. Eventually, he got involved in there, started working out with the wrestlers. He was very adept different types of judo and karate got to know the wrestlers they started training him at the same time tom was doing publicity for paul bosch one thing led to another and pretty soon he gave up the typewriter for the ring i tell you that reminds me of another fella a larry madison who did the same thing when he didn't know how to wrestle but he did the same thing for sam musk for years well that's true that's how we started that's right typing the stories doing the releases calling in the results uh the late ray gillespie was there at ringside all the matches at keel auditorium in the arena it was quite a training ground with people like the late Ray Gillespie and, of course, our dear friend, the master of them all, Sam Muchnick. Max Blue catches a kick to the stomach by Tom Pritchard. Pritchard ducking inside. Blue blocking the suplex. He lifts Pritchard. Max Blue with a body slam on Tom Pritchard. Blue showing a lot of fire right here. Tag made to Buddy Landell. Max Blue certainly making a showing right there. Landell misses the elbow. Oh, Pritchard doesn't miss that flying cross body block, but he only gets a count of one. Landell with a kick to the stomach and then a knee lift by Buddy Landell. Flying mare by Landell and then he hooks the head of Tom Pritchard. Landell squeezing Pritchard's head. Pritchard trying to get to his feet. A referee keeping a close eye on the proceedings. Pritchard bangs an elbow into the stomach, a second elbow. Landell misses with another elbow. Oh, Landell caught him, lost him. Reverse rolling cradle backfires because Landell holds the ropes. Do the job, get in here, says Buddy Landell to Max Blue. Five minutes will last, five minutes left. Pritchard, the forearm smash to Max Blue. Pritchard, oh, takes to the air with the flying feet and clubs. Max Blue, here comes Chavo Guerrero. Guerrero whips Blue to the ropes. Nice drop toe hold, nicely done. Guerrero stepping inside with a double toe hold. Leaning far, grabs the arm. There is your classic surfboard. Your classic surfboard, old boy, right out of the textbook. Chavo Guerrero bringing Max Blue back. That can be a submission hold, believe me. Landell knows it. Here comes Landell from the blind side. 
Landell knows exactly how punishing that hold of Chavo Guerrero's could be. Guerrero with a kick into the side and then a kick to the neck of Max Flew by Chavo Guerrero. Forearm uppercut by Chavo Guerrero. Tag made to Tom Pritchard. Hey, Guerrero and Pritchard are making quite a tag team combination. Oh, Max Blue whipped to the ropes. Guerrero and Pritchard firing elbows at Max Blue. Do something else. Buddy Landell to Max Blue. Oh, Blue's trying his best. Just that right now that well-oiled machine is named Chavo Guerrero and Tom Pritchard. Back suplex by Chavo Guerrero. Unselfish tag by Guerrero. Blue was in trouble, and Guerrero gave the tag to Pritchard. Flying cross body block. Count of one, two, and three. And Buddy Landell is infuriated. Look at Landell. He's yelling at Max Blue. What's the matter with you, man? You can't blame Max Blue for that. I got to tell you, Guerrero and Pritchard is one move after another. I mean, they were all over their air in that ring. Landell upset with Max Blue. But Max Blue can't really take the blame for this. He just got caught in a well-oiled machine. Let's go to Mickey Garagiola. In six minutes and 46 seconds with cross body block, the winner, Tom Pritchard, Chavo Guerrero. This match, a one fall with a 10 minute time limit. Introducing from Columbus, Georgia, weighing 241 pounds, Jerry Oak. From New York, New York, weighing 332 pounds, Butcher Salvecchio. Referee, Eddie Smith. Oh, Butcher Salvecchio comes up behind Jerry Oates. And Salvecchio, Oates still has his jacket on. Salvecchio pounding on Jerry Oates. A big man, 336 pounds. Jerry Oates fighting back. Oates puts Salvecchio down. Oates with an uppercut. Salvicio started it. Jerry Oates with a forearm uppercut. Catches Salvicio right in the mouth. A knee lift by Jerry Oates, the Georgia Greyhound. Flying there by Oates. Remember, next Saturday night at Keel, Oates is going to have Cowboy Scott Casey as his partner against Dick Murdoch and the man who taught Murdoch everything he knows, killer Carl Cox. Salvicio whipped to the ropes. Elbow smash nearly takes off Salvicio's head. Oates, the spinning toe hold. The spinning toe hold by Jerry Oates on Butcher Salvicio. Salvicio crying out. And he submits Jerry Oates, the Georgia Greyhound, was flying today. Well, think about that, Mr. Murdoch. Jerry Oates was caught by surprise. He never got his jacket off. And then he tore right into Salvicio, caught him with an elbow smash, and then the spinning toe hold. That's enough to stop anybody. Here's ring announcer Mickey Garagiola. In 55 seconds of spinning toe hold, the winner, Jerry Oates. The first mini event, a one fall with a 20 minute time limit. Introducing from Knoxville, Tennessee, weighing 228 pounds, Ron Sexton. And from Portland, Oregon, weighing 259 pounds, Ken Patera, referee, Eddie Smith. The world's strongest wrestler, Ken Patera, clashes with Ron Sexton. Patera taking his time, removing his warm-up guard. Really, that's mostly a psychological ploy, I think, on Patera's part because it makes his opponent wait. It makes his opponent, in this case, Ron Sexton, get antsy, get frustrated, get that adrenaline building, feel the excitement starting to grow. The crowd hoots and hollers at Patera. Sexton, though, staying pretty patient. He's complaining a little bit to referee Eddie Smith. But he's keeping his head, he's keeping his cool, and that's very important. You cannot afford to make a mistake against as powerful a man as Ken Patera. Mistakes cost against him. Patera yelling at the crowd there, yelling at Patera about Jack Briscoe. And of course, Patera just lost a very controversial Texas death match to Briscoe. And talking about Briscoe to Patera is just not the thing to do, believe me. Nice arm drag that was by Patera. And a nice arm drag by Ron Sexton on Patera. The crowd loved it. In that death match against Briscoe, each man won three falls. They fell out of the ring during the 30-second rest period. We're battling out there. The referee 
has to make a 10 count at the start of each fall to determine that each man is able to continue. If one of the two men does not answer that 10 count, he's the loser of the match. And that's one way, of course, to tell when a wrestler is worn down. The referee began making that 10 count as the two were fighting outside the ring. Briscoe rolled back into the ring at about seven, but Terra did not. And the referee ruled that Patera, because he did not answer the bell inside the ring, was unable to continue, and he awarded the death match to Jack Briscoe. Probably the correct interpretation under those rules that existed. Don't tell Ken Patera that. He is just incensed. As far as he's concerned, it was nothing short of pure, outright robbery by Jack Briscoe. But, of course, Patera has a chance to redeem himself when he and Sergeant Slaughter think of that combination go against Rocky Johnson and Andre the Giant. The world's biggest wrestler, Andre the Giant, 7'5", 470 pounds with Rocky Johnson, who might just be the fastest, most dynamic grappler in the world against maybe one of the meanest in Sergeant Slaughter and the strongest in Ken Patera. Can Patera slam Andre? He says he can. He's lifted more than 500 pounds overhead. Andre tips the scales at 470 pounds, and Ken Patera right there with the wrist lock on Ron Sexton. Ken Patera says that he can slam Andre the Giant. And how about Sergeant Slaughter? He has a hold called the Cobra Clutch. It's a neck breaker. Forces a concession. It can make a man become unconscious. And Slaughter says, well, if Patera can slam him, I can put that Cobra Clutch on him. And Andre's no different than anybody else, according to Slaughter. He says Andre, neither Andre nor Rocky Johnson can break out of his Cobra Clutch if he gets the chance to apply it. What a tag match that is. Nice move by Sexton. Going to the knee of Ken Patera, but Patera's in the ropes and Sexton must break. Patera circling Sexton, grabbing for that leg of Ken Patera. Patera, is he trying to lure Sexton to him? Get him in tight where that strength of Ken Patera can really turn the tide. Sexton's giving away nearly 40 pounds to Ken Patera, a little bit more than 30 pounds. Patera's weight fluctuating anywhere from 255 to 265. Oh, Patera slams that forearm in there like a sledgehammer. Sexton pitched right out of the ring by Ken Patera. Think he can throw Andre out of the ring like that? There goes Patera out after Ron Sexton. Patera stopping on Sexton outside the ring. Patera was in a foul mood to begin with. He lifts Sexton outside the ring with one arm and body slams him on the concrete floor. Patera then stopped on the head of Sexton after Patera slammed Sexton on that concrete floor. Okay, he can body slam Ron Sexton. Wonder if he could do that to Andre the Giant in the ring or outside the ring. How will his muscle compare to the speed of Rocky Johnson? And Johnson's no slouch when it comes to physique. Look at the muscles on Johnson. He might be able to match Patera muscle for muscle. Patera hooks the head of Sexton, lifts him into the air for a suplex, and drives Sexton down into the mat. Can Patera crushing Sexton? Where's your Briscoe now, yells Ken Patera. Then he yelled something about Andre. Elbow drop right across the lungs by Ken Patera. Count of one, two, Sexton, Spunky. Don't forget, he won his last time out on wrestling at the chase. He'd like to make it two in a row at the expense of Patera. Five minutes have expired, 15 minutes left. You can hear that forearm pop as Patera slammed it into the back. There's a bear hug by Patera, the man who was the first ever to lift more than 500 pounds overhead, the man who holds 26 American records for weightlifting. He's squeezing on Sexton and trying to keep his head low so that the elbow smashes of Sexton have no effect. Patera squeezing, squeezing Sexton. Trying to squeeze the wind right out of Sexton, but now Sexton forcing the head back. If he can work on the face of Patera, he might be able to get out of that bear hug. Oh, Sexton gouges the eyes. And maybe that's an indication right there that Sexton realizes the trouble he's in, and he gouges the eyes of Patera. Patera with the perspiration going across where he had his face scraped. That has to sting, and now Sexton finds an opening in the midsection. Patera is still temporarily blinded. Sexton trying to follow up the advantage. Patera whipped to the ropes. Up and over the top goes Patera. And Sexton has something going here. Patera let him slip away. 
and Napatera has to retreat to the corner. Sexton right on top of him. Fiery Ron Sexton, arm whipped. Oh, Patera reverses it. Patera lifts Sexton. Man handles it. Body slam by Patera on Sexton after Sexton was jammed into those turnbuckles. Flying elbow drop misses. Sexton rolled away. You must admire Ryan Sexton. He's giving Ken Patera fits. Patera again lifts him to the air. Uh oh, he has him over the shoulder. What's going here? The shoulder breaker. The shoulder breaker by Ken Patera, and he does it well. So much of his stuff is involved with lifting someone. You have to wonder what happens if he tries to lift Andre for something like the shoulder breaker. Sexton still down. Patera staying behind him. Oh, he's lining Sexton up. He has something in mind, and I wouldn't be surprised to see him go behind for the full Nelson and the swinging neck breaker. There it is. He just lifts Sexton right off his feet with the full Nelson jerking that neck around, really trying to snap the neck of Sexton. There he swings him around and around. Sexton really risking neck injury right here as Patera, with all of that power, the world's strongest wrestler with the swinging neck breaker and full Nelson. I don't even know if Sexton has enough strength to give up. His arms are limp, and I think the referee stopped the match. Sexton simply couldn't say yes. He was down, hurt, and Eddie Smith stopped the match because of that swinging neck breaker. Sexton just couldn't go on, and the winner, clearly, with a lot of power behind him, is Ken Batera. Here's Mickey Garagiola. In seven minutes and 30 seconds, with the full Nelson, the winner, Ken Patera. The main event, a one fall with a 15-minute time limit. Introducing from Denton, Texas, weighing 235 pounds, Kevin Von Erich. From Charlotte, North Carolina, weighing 236 pounds, Ron Starr, referee Chuck Raleigh. The fans here in the KPLR TV studio have a tough choice as Ron Starr and Kevin Von Erich shake hands. Who to root for? I imagine they'll try to split it and root for both because there should be some dandy wrestling involved in this. Star goes behind Kevin. Von Erich switches nicely. He's behind Star. Star returns the favor, takes Kevin down, tried to roll him into a cradle. Kevin reaches behind him. Star blocks that with the arm. Kevin brings Star over the hip, comes up with a wrist lock on Ron Star. Star rolls over, gets Chuck Riley. Kevin Von Erich thrown over the side by Ron Starr. A fast moving exchange that even involved the referee, Chuck Riley. Starr checks to make sure Riley's okay, which he is. A lot of referees will tell you a match like this, with good quick scientific action, is sometimes harder to work than a rough match. Clean break. The crowd appreciates it. Ron Starr with an arm bar, working also in the wrist area on Kevin Von Erich. Starr twists the arm of Kevin. Starr twisting some more, trying to force Kevin down to the mat. Starr really applying the pressure to Kevin Von Erich, and you can see right where that leg is, underneath the shoulder, making it even harder for Kevin Von Erich to regain his feet. So Kevin flips over, comes up, counters to a wrist lock. Down goes Starr. Good move by Kevin Von Erich. Two good wrestlers here. How do you handicap one like this, Mick? Tough one oh, to this, pick. This is. This is really tough. I mean, scientific and great. Two top wrestlers right here. This star is something else. You good know? counter there by Star to go to the hammerlock on Kevin Von Erich. Kevin trying to come to his feet while trapped in the hammerlock of Ron Star. Counter by Kevin Von Erich. This will be a good lesson on counters, takedowns, escapes. Star comes up on top, goes behind Kevin. Kevin rolls over and out. They both come up quickly and they're eye to eye. Good wrestling by both men and they know it, they respect each other. Something that Dory Funk Jr. talked about last weekend when he said, well, I want to wrestle him, but I respect him too. I don't know if Dory Jr. has that much respect for Dick Murdoch though. He respects his toughness, I'm sure, and the fact that he's won many big matches but whether or not he respects him in terms of a professional level of the type of tactics that Murdoch uses, well, that I would question whether Dory Jr. has that type of respect for someone like Dick Murdoch. He apparently does for the Von Erich clan. 
Ron Starr with the side headlock on. Kevin Von Erich. Wonder if Starr is thinking about that body scissors Kevin has been developing. He can use it both as a pin and we hear now as a submission. He's developed enough strength in his legs. It's very important, of course, the positioning of the legs, the extension of the muscles so that they're in the proper spot of the opponent's body. Star twisting back on Kevin Von Erich's head with that side headlock. Of course, a lot of the fans have seen some of the pictures that were contained in the wrestling program of that body scissors. Flying tackle by Star, and that showed photos of hip toss by Kevin Von Erich. Kevin kicked away by Star, no body press there. Side headlock by Star, down goes Kevin. As we were saying, those it, it was actually a sequence of photos which showed. Kevin starting out on the burlap bag. Full bag, full of, I believe it was wheat at the time. Kevin put the body scissors on that bag, and as he can do very often now, literally squeezed it, smashed the bag wide open, and emptied that bag. Now think if he can do that with a burlap bag on a, around wheat. That is difficult to do. Try it sometime. Find out how hard it is to do. Think what he can do to someone's midsection. Yeah, I hate to see that happen. <laughs> There's the head scissors by Kevin Von Erich. Star ended up in the ropes and Star has to shake his head. That head scissors obviously just as effective as the body scissors. The one thing about Von Erich, he's got that drop kick, they got that so claw legs. hole. And then, you know, they got so many holes. That so many things you can think about and worry about. That body scissors, though, really a hole that he got the idea from, from Joe Stecker. Joe Stecker, by way of saying a bunch of guys to say, because I believe Stecker was dead by the time Kevin was born. Stecker was a three-time world heavyweight champion, originally winning the title in 1915. His last reign began when he won it here in St. Louis in 1925. Five minutes of elapsed, ten minutes left. Joe Stecker popularized the body scissors, used it as a submission hold. And like Kevin, trained by breaking open bags of wheat. Sam Muchnick was aware of this. He'd seen Stecker when Sam was a sports writer for the old St. Louis Times. And when he saw Kevin, the power that Kevin had in his legs, he got Kevin aside and says, Kevin, this is something you should think about. He explained a little bit about it to him. Kevin did some research on his own and with the help of his father and brother David, trained on strengthening those legs. And now that body scissors is just about perfected. Star carrying Kevin Von Erich to the corner. Kevin. Lift it over the side. Chuck Riley wants a clean break and gets one from Ron Starr. Another round of applause for two sportsmanlike competitors, Ron Starr and Kevin Von Erich. Kevin with a leg dive doesn't get there. Starr eluded it. Both men pretty quick. Right now it's like a chess match. Each one's looking for a little opening. Well, where can I get into this guy? What can I do to him to slow him down or get him down the mat? Star shakes his head. You're not going to get me that way. <laughs> they tie up. Star moves behind Kevin Von Erich with a full Nelson. Kevin, will he try to muscle his way out of it? He's just behind for Star's head. Couldn't pull him forward. Kevin flexing. Drops out, beautiful move by Kevin Von Erich. Star managed to roll him away. Good escape by Kevin Von Erich. Star shakes his head, and I think it's as much an admiration and respect for Kevin's ability as anything. Star with a fireman's carry. Comes up with an arm lock on Kevin Von Erich. Star puts his knee against Kevin's head. Kevin rolls under, forcing his way to his feet. No, he's not coming off that knee because Star has the leverage right now. Star pulling on the arm of Kevin Von Erich. Pretty even so far. A lot of good moves by both men. Oh, Kevin got out and came out flying with a drop kick. Kevin landed heavily. And Starr got tagged just on the face. He almost got away, but not quite. And Kevin landed heavily himself because his drop kick was not totally accurate. And that allowed Starr to regain the arm bar on Kevin Von Erich. Kevin hooked the leg. He was going to go for the fireman's carry. Starr realized it and lifted that leg away. 
The two men end up in the ropes. Clean break by Kevin Von Erich. Well, neither man has had much of an head yet. No near pins. Pretty even so far. Good test. A good demonstration of holds. I don't think the match between Dory Funk Jr. and Dick Murdoch is going to be quite like this. Murdoch's a heck of a wrestler. Don't kid yourself. He knows what to do. He knows the holds. He knows the escapes. He knows how to get those quick little cradles that mean victory sometimes. That could end up a war. And I'll tell you, when Kevin Von Erich takes on Bobby Duncan, Duncan's a totally different type of opponent than Ron Starr. Duncan, much bigger, coming in around 290 pounds. He's a brawler. He gets in there, uses his weight, leans on him, in them constantly, using his weight and his size, trying to wear down an opponent. And of course, he has that bulldog headlock, which has been very effective for him. So Kevin Von Erich, first with Ron Starr, and then... Of course, coming up with Bobby Duncan, two tough tests for Kevin Von Erich, two totally different styles. Starr dumps Kevin over and gets his arm free. Kevin says, pretty good, good move. A little bit of congratulations from Kevin Von Erich, which doesn't change the fact he'd love nothing better than to get Starr's shoulders on that mat. Short arm scissors by Ron Starr, our figure four arm lock, if you prefer that tag to it. Whatever name you apply, that is a very good hold. And that could be a toughie for Kevin to get out of. Kevin rolls over, Star rolls right with him. Good move by Star there. The short arm scissors by Ron Star and Kevin Von Erich. Now even in a match like this, with two scientific wrestlers involved, two men who believe in sportsmanship, tempers can get frayed, get hot, you get angry, something doesn't work right for you, the perspiration's in your eyes, your eyes are burning a little bit, you're getting a mat burn. Pretty easy to lose your temper in there. Rolling short arm scissors now by Ron Starr. Hey, this could be followed up by a pit or a submission. Ron Starr with the rolling short arm scissors, bringing Kevin Von Erich over once more. Ten minutes have expired, five minutes left. They rolled and rolled and rolled. Kevin managed to jackknife himself back over on top. They ended up in the ropes and once more, clean break by both men. Side headlock by Kevin Von Erich on Ron Starr. Kevin tossed to the ropes. Hip tossed by Starr. Kevin hangs on, but it's Starr who comes up with the hold. Kevin had a good idea hanging on to the arm, but Starr countered quickly inside, came up with that short arm scissors once more on Kevin Von Erich. This is the type of hold that can cut off the blood flow to Kevin's hand, and you'll have to watch that carefully. It really could immobilize that left hand. Oop, look out, Star was in a cradle. That's as close as we've been to a pin there. He had a count of two on Star's shoulders, right, and it caused Star to release the short arm scissors. Another warm round of applause for Ron Star and Kevin Von Erich. Cautiously, tentatively, they reach out, and lock fingers. Test of strength between Ron Star and Kevin Von Erich. Both men bending. Twisting, trying to find out where the edge is. They come around backwards, come around frontwards. Kevin comes out, gets a wrist lock. Good work by Kevin Von Erich on Ron Starr. Starr tossed over the hip. Kevin with the wrist lock. Starr cries out as Kevin pours on the pressure with that wrist lock. Now Starr twists about, couldn't bring it all the way over. Too much pressure from Kevin Von Erich. Three minutes left, three minutes. Three minutes remain in a very even battle between Ron Starr and Kevin Von Erich. Kevin tripped down by Starr. Kevin counters nicely to the hammer lock on Ron Starr. Kevin Von Erich with the hammer lock. Chuck Riley is told by Starr that Starr will not give up. Kevin twists that hammer lock even further up behind the back of Ron Starr. You're going to have to earn it, says Kevin to Ron Starr. Starr with a fireman's carry breaks the arm free. Starr was going to pounce. Kevin was already poised to spring. Star locks both arms, double arm lock. He might be able to flip him over. 
with a double arm suplex, but Kevin can get underneath two. Double arm suplex by Starr. He goes for the pin. Out of one. Kevin Von Eric throws off Ryan Starr. Starr going for the vertical suplex. Yes, the suplex by Ryan Starr. This could be it. No, not even a count of one. And Kevin Von Eric survives the suplex. Von Eric with a blow to the stomach and then a drop kick. Floor is Ron Starr. Kevin trips the legs to dump Ron Starr. Leg snap by Kevin Von Eric. The leg snap. Yanking back on that hamstring, snapping it, hurting it. Elbow smashed to the head by Ron Starr. The match getting a little rougher now. The temper's getting a little bit more worn. Kevin Von Eric flipped to the ropes. Oh, they both tried drop kicks. Both men tried drop kicks, and both men go down. They'll have a count of 10. Starr was up for the drop kick, just as Kevin Von Eric went up to try a drop kick himself. One minute left. One minute. Only a minute remaining. Kevin lifts Star body slam by Kevin Von Erich. He covers Star but cannot keep those shoulders down. Kevin hits the rope. What's this? Giant splash? Oh, he missed. Star roll away. The giant splash missed. Star mounts the ropes. Star with the atomic drop and he misses. Star trying to dive bomb Kevin Von Erich off the ropes, but Kevin had enough presence of mind to roll away. Both men a bit the worse for wear right now. Kevin whipped to the ropes. Star tries to flip him. Jackknife and cradle. Jackknife and cradle. Kind of one. Oh, and Star rolls those shoulders off. There's the body scissors. There's that body scissors, and Star goes for the ropes. The body scissors by Kevin Von Erich, and Star had to go for the ropes to save himself. Oh, that body scissors was on Ron Star, and Star is gasping as he comes up. There's the bell, and we may almost have seen the debut of that body scissors as a submission hold on television, but they were too near the ropes, and as soon as Kevin Von Eric put it on, Star grabbed those ropes to congratulate each other and are rewarded with a warm round of applause. They deserve it. Great match. Here's Mickey. With time expires, referee Chuck Riley declares the match a draw. Good this match, a mixed tag team match, one fall, 10 minute time limit. Introducing from Nashville, Tennessee, weighing 137 pounds, Debbie Cohn. From Dallas, Texas, weighing 235 pounds, Scout Casey. From New Orleans, Louisiana, weighing 134 pounds, Donna Day. From San Antonio, Texas, weighing 239 pounds, Tully Blanchard, referee Eddie Smith, Mark Schreiner. Something a little different for St. Louis wrestling. Something fairly unique, a mixed tag match, man and woman versus man and woman. Tully Blanchard and Donna Day against Scott Casey and Debbie Cohn. The rules are very basic. It has to start out man against man and girl against girl if a tag is made. Crowd begins chanting at Tully Blanchard, we want Spike. And everybody knows about the troubles they've had. If a tag is made by one girl to the man, then the other man must come in the ring immediately. So really, it's never a man against woman. Side headlock by Donna Day on Debbie Combs. Bernie Carno, the director, says, I'd like to get one of those matches. I, the only thing is, I'd skip part of the tag, and I'll get in there with either Donna or Debbie. I have to agree with you, Larry. I don't think Tully Blanchard is a favorite here. I don't think they like Tully. I don't think they like him at all. He's not a bad golfer, which has nothing to do with his <laughs> well, nothing to do with Spike Hubert's going to do to him. <laughs> Side headlock by Donna Day on Debbie Combs. Tully Blanchard. Tully has made a lot of good points over the years, and certainly one of those is when you're on top, you win some and you lose some. Nobody's undefeated. The key is if you lose one, you got to keep fighting back. Spike Huber can talk about that. So can Brody. So can Volkov. So can Murdoch in his early days. Maybe even Killer Carl Cox. I don't know about Alex. Alex, of course, as you heard, Donna Day stumbling over Debbie Combs. Debbie Combs grabbing Donna Day, though, pulling the hair. And Donna Day had a tough spill there. Flying mare by Debbie Combs. Another flying mare by Debbie Combs. A third flying mare, and then Debbie ties up the head of Donna Day. We were saying about Alex. 
Uh, Mickey met him. I have never met Alex. But uh, Alex, I guess, it was a friend of Killer Carl Cox. We're Scott Casey talking about that a couple of weeks ago here on St. Louis Wrestling. <laughs> Alex, I guess, I don't know, where is Alex? Mickey, you, think, inter you got introduced to him. No, I Alex, didn't. I think, is with Harvey right now. Harvey? Yeah, was that the rabbit's name? Oh, I think so. Yes, I think so. Larry, I think the more we do this, I think the more you and I better go to a home. <laughs> we better look for Alex. God, Alex has got us half crazy. <laughs> but everybody, everybody's got their own pet. And killer caller Carl Cox has got Alex. And that he looks upon Alex to help him out when he gets in a tight spot. When you get into Keel next Saturday night, look up at the roof. Maybe you'll see Alex. Cox will be looking there. Murdoch better be looking across that ring. He better have both shoulders up in the mat. Yeah, or Mr. Killer Jerry Cox. Oates. Yeah, right. Or Scott Casey will slam those shoulders right into the canvas. Test the strength between Donna Day and Debbie Combs. Combs goes down. Crowd chanting about Spike Huber to Tully Blanchard. This is they'll be chanting about Spike Huber to the Freebird, Terry Gordy. Now wrist lock by Donna Day on Debbie Combs. Debbie struggling to her feet. Flying mare by Debbie Combs. She tags Scott Casey. And that means Tully Blanchard comes into action. So, Mr. Casey against Mr. Blanchard. Tully wants to complain to the referee. He hasn't even made contact with Scott Casey yet. He's got a complaint. Tully and Scott tie up. Tully twists the arm over. Casey reverses. Tully reverses. Down goes Casey. Down goes Blanchard. Whoa, says Tully Blanchard. Watch his fist, yells Tully Blanchard. Casey, caught in a side headlock by Tully Blanchard. It's gonna be a fast moving popular team, Scott Casey and Jerry Oates. Blanchard, let's Casey, body slam. Elbow drop from Blanchard. He covers, count of one. Nice counter by Scott Casey. Blanchard blocks it though, goes behind Casey. Casey manages to hang on to the arms. Good wrestling both ways. Elbow smash to the shoulder by Scott Casey. Casey twisting the arm. Casey again twists that arm around. Blanchard crying out. An arm bar arm twist combination and Scott Casey's getting his money's worth. Now Blanchard could get over and tag down a day. He could really change this momentum because Debbie Combs would have to come in. You have two fresh people. The referee makes sure that Blanchard's not entangled in the ropes. And Donna Day, Tully Blanchard's partner, is very unhappy about things. Five minutes of a lapse, five minutes left. Scott Casey, really a personable young man. He was sitting with us here a couple of weeks ago on St. Louis Wrestling. What a beautiful personality. Nice guy, and a nice guy who's not at all finishing last. As he's right up there in Greater St. Louis Wrestling Enterprise has proven a lot of top wrestlers in the world, maybe for political reasons, they never got the opportunity to wrestle here before. But they are now, and they are making their mark. You certainly cannot quibble with the credentials of people like Nikolai Volkov, King Kong Brody, the Freebird, Terry Gardy, Spike Huber, Dick Murdoch, Jerry Oates, Scott Casey, Killer Carl Cox, Tully Blanchard, Terry Taylor, Professor Toru Tanaka, and the list is endless. We're for real, baby. Don't let somebody else tell you differently, because they are wrong. Debbie Combs, monkey flip on Donna Day. Donna says, I'm leaving, that hurt. Oh. That's how Mickey Garagiola seats people at Pietro's. Same way, if you don't sit down at my table, I'll make throw the body slam on you. <laughs> She's trying to get, he's trying to get Debbie to be the maitre d'. Oh. Oh. oh, how about that? I didn't know Tully was a gentleman quite that well. Let's go. Whoop. Whoa. Here comes Donna. That's what happens when you try to leave the restaurant. You haven't tipped Mickey. Goodbye, Charlie. Debbie Combs, a lot of bad blood between these two girls, Debbie Combs and Donna Day. Donna's been popping off a lot about Debbie's mother, Cora. And you heard Cora say last weekend here on St. Louis Wrestling. I'm getting a little tired of that young lady popping off. I may have been in retirement except for one match for a couple of years. She keeps that up. I'm going to come back and teach her a thing or two. And she could. 
Look at the choke yells, Tully Blanchard. Debbie pounds on Donna Day, dumps her, and catapults her. Three minutes left, three minutes. Three minutes remaining, and Scott Casey's tagged into the ring against Tully Blanchard. Donna Day checking that the rib cage is still there, that the pelvis is still attached the same place it was. Mickey says, I don't think it is. Boy, I gotta admit, that's a dangerous move. Mickey's begging off. What's the matter? You been out with Mansfield again? The continental lover, Eddie Mansfield, and Mickey Garagiola. I don't know, Blanche is in the air, but he's pretty doggone close. Casey fights his way out oh. of it. Casey with an elbow smash to the head. Casey hurls Blanchard into the corner. Oh! Blanchard falls oh. over. But that could be an automatic disqualification if it was ruled that the, ref, that the opponent did it intentionally, but he didn't. Make a tag, says Blanchard. Scott Casey brings in Debbie Cole. Blanchard wants his hand raised by verdict of disqualification. Well, Tully was up on that top rope, but I think he took advantage of things. He's a smart fox. Donna Day dumps Debbie Cole. She's going to try the same thing on Debbie that Debbie did to her. Oh, she catapults Debbie into the ropes. Throw it first. Good use of the ring and the ropes by Donna Day. Debbie Cole whipped the ropes. Close line by Donna Day. The Day jolted herself. I think she got her arm tangled up underneath the chin of Debbie Cole. Both ladies a bit stunned right now. Casey urging Debbie up. Tolly on it, Donna Day. Whoop. Debbie blocks at the small package. Count of one, up there, struggling around, caught in that small package, the front rolling cradle. Here comes Blanchard rolling down a day up on top. Scott Casey gets there, and I think Day's shoulders are down, and there it is! I think, yes, Debbie Cole did it up on top. Tully Blanchard interfered, the referees ran him out, Scott Casey interfered. Everybody was rolling around on shoulders and ended up that Debbie Combs had the small package on Donna Day, and Donna Day says to Tully Blanchard, whose side are you on? I don't think she realized it was Casey that rolled that small package one more time. Let's go to Mickey Garagiola. In nine minutes and two seconds, small package, the winning team of Scouts Casey and Debbie Combs. <laughs> this match is a one fall with a 10 minute time limit. Introducing from Palm Spring, California, Weighing 232 pounds, Sammy Darrow. From Waxahachie, Texas. Weighing 270 pounds, Kick Murdoch. Dick Murdoch takes on Sammy Darrow. Sammy Darrow, good looking young athlete, and Dick Murdoch is rough and tough as they come. <laughs> Darrow threatening to throw a punch. Murdoch, I believe, spotted Jerry Oates sitting in the background watching him. And I'm sure he's watching to see if he can pick up something before next Saturday's action at Keele Auditorium. And Murdoch's with his teacher, Killer Carl Cox, against Jerry Oates and Scott Casey. Dick Murdoch. Oh, he's coming out like a killer. Murdoch. Oh, what a body slam by Murdoch. Murdoch. Dragging Sammy Darrow to the apron. Dick Murdoch has Darrow suspended on the apron, driving an elbow into the throat and into the chest. Murdoch bringing Darrow. Look out. Murdoch a little bit going berserk outside the ring. And here comes Lee Warren outside the ring to restore some order. Murdoch slamming him back in after Murdoch a clobber Darrow with a post at ringside, one of the stanchions. Murdoch dropping Darrow with an elbow smash. Murdoch grabs Sammy Darrow, hooks the head. Oh, look out, the Texas Brain Buster. The Texas Brain Buster by Dick Murdoch. He covers Darrow, kind of one, two, and three. The Texas Tornado ran rough shot over there. You'll get your chance next Saturday. Next Saturday, you'll find out, Mr. Murdoch. Next Saturday. Let's go to the ring and Mickey Garagiola. 
in one minute and 31 seconds. This match, it won't fall with a 10 minute time limit. Introducing from Tampa, Florida, weighing 245 pounds, Al Perez. Weighing 319 pounds from Russia, Nikolai Volkov, referee Ed Wine. How would you like to be in Al Perez's shoe right now? Al Perez, a sparkling young athlete. Tremendous future in this business Al Perez has, and a tremendous thrilly right now that he has. He fights back against Volkov. Volkov and Perez landing some forearms. Perez can wrestle. He proved that as he was a Florida State High School champion. He has tremendous amateur background, and he is nobody's going to be pushed around. He fights back against Volkov. If Perez could knock off Volkov here, what a feather in his cap it would be because, of course, next Saturday night, it's Volkov against King Kong Brody. Brody is back at Keel Auditorium. Next Saturday, Volkov would love to nail Brody with a knee like that, as he just did Perez. But remember, this time, there's something different. Two referees. One referee in the ring, one referee outside the ring. Two referees for Brody and Volkov. The last time they met, September 17th, Professor Tanaka, who's a close ally of Volkov, got himself involved. And, of course, Spike Huber, who has a tremendous friendship with King Kong Brody Veldt, he had to get himself involved. The whole thing really ended up in chaos at his qualification. Brody and Volkov don't need any help. And that's what that second referee is there going, to, going to be there to make sure of. Brody and Volkov next Saturday. Huber has his own hands full against the fabulous Freebird, Terry Gordy. And that's going to be a tremendous match. Everybody in the wrestling world will have their eyes on St. Louis next Saturday night because Volkov against Brody with two referees, Spike Huber against the Freebird, Terry Gordy. Can Huber keep things rolling? Can Gordy keep his momentum going? Plus, Murdoch and his teacher, Killer Carl Cox, who might even bring Alex along so Mickey can talk to him, oh, against no. Cowboy Scott Casey and Jerry Oates. And Oates and Murdoch have no love lost for one another either. Ed Warren balling out Nikolai Volkov for the battery that Volkov was dishing out to Perez in the corner. Volkov with a kick to the head of Al Perez. Perez has his hands full, but I believe he's more than capable of making Nikolai Volkov battered, bruised, and maybe beaten. Perez knocked down to one knee. Volkov grabs Perez and pitches him out of the ring right down to the cement floor of the arena sports studio. Jam-packed once again. Volkov raising his hands in triumph as Perez tries to regain his bearings. There he is. Look at that chest. Look at the neck on that man. Former member of the Russian Olympic weightlifting team. He stops Perez and knocks him right off the apron. The man who maybe has proven that King Kong Brody is not indestructible. He can certainly prove it. He can etch it in concrete next Saturday night. Brody and Volkov, Keel Auditorium, in the site of many great, great matches over the years. Many tremendous, hot, blazing feuds have been settled right in that ring. And Brody and Volkov are going to try to settle it next Saturday. Volkov yells, USA, huh? Perez, oh, he drives that shoulder right to the solar plexus of Volkov. Alex Perez, Al Perez, pounding on Volkov, driving Volkov to the corner. Volkov slammed to the corner, but then he has the presence of mind to bring that big boot up into the chest of Perez. Volkov, another kick to the head. Volkov comes off the ropes and stops on the back of Al Perez. Nikolai Volkov standing on the throat and on the chest of Al Perez. 320 pounds. He's bigger than Brody. Think of that. Brody's going to give away almost 40 pounds to this man when they step into the ring. Brody's a bit taller. I think Volkov's a bit wider, if that seems possible. It's hard to believe, knowing King Kong Brody, that anybody could be wider than he is. Volkov with a headbutt into the neck of Al Perez. I think the hair on Brody makes him look bigger because this guy here has got a crew cut here. Volkov. They do have different barbers. Yeah, I, I believe so. Buddy Tama in Fairview Heights. Somebody else must go to one of your barbers. I don't think Brody's been a barber for some time. <laughs> but that's his style. That's Brody. One of a kind. Non-conformist, sure. Want to call him a rebel? Go ahead and call him a rebel. He's proud of it. With good reason. And from everything I know about King Kong Brody is 
that man stands tall under any kind of pressure in any kind of situation he doesn't back down and he's under all the pressure in the world next saturday night against volkov he'll be back from japan tomorrow he's gonna sit at home down in south texas all week and think about volkov five minutes have expired five minutes left Volkov pounding on the back of muscular Al Perez. Volkov with a forearm smash. That's like a sledgehammer coming home. Perez reaching inside that cross arm grip. I think Volkov realized Perez had an idea there. Perez fighting back. A fiery Florden clamps on a side headlock. Volkov whips him to the ropes. Oh. Flying tackle. Volkov stands his ground. Perez drop kick. Volkov knocked to the ropes. Perez comes flying again. Cross body. Volkov caught him. Volkov caught him. Backbreaker. Cradle. Nikolai. Volkov caught Perez in midair and covers him with a cradle after the backbreaker. Well, there's that power. Perez with a flying cross body block. And Volkov somehow caught him in the air. It's time for the main event on Classic St. Louis Wrestling. Ric Flair and King Kong Brody were two of the most dynamic performers in wrestling during the early 1980s. When Flair defended the World Heavyweight Championship against Brody, it was headline news all around the globe. St. Louis really once again was established as the capital of wrestling. Everybody wanted to see Flair against Brody. They sent cameras from Japan with KPLR TV providing the production crew so that luckily now, over 20 years later, we get a chance to enjoy what proved to be truly a classic match. Brody, big, strong, explosive. A lot of people thought he might not be able to keep his temper under control. Maybe he'd never win the World Heavyweight Championship, but he's going to show you something different here. And Ric Flair, quick, smart, a gambler. Maybe he'd make that big mistake. And you make one mistake against King Kong Brody back in those days, baby, you were going down. Flair against Brody, it was a classic match. And when you look back at it today, this was the end of the golden era of St. Louis. Let's go to the main event and the ring announcer. Oh, that's right, I'm the ring announcer. Let's go to the ring. This is the main event of the evening for the World Heavyweight Championship and Gold Belt as recognized by the National Wrestling Alliance. Two out of three falls, one hour time limit, two minute rest period between the falls. The referee is Lee Warren. Introducing first, from Minneapolis, Minnesota, weighing 200. 43 pounds, the world heavyweight champion, Nature Boy Rick Flair. Ring announcer no Larry Matchik ni yori mashite. Dai 62 dai NWA Sekai Heavy Q Champion Rick Flair ya shoukai sare mashita. And the challenger. Weighing 280 pounds, the one and the only King Kong Brady. 16,765 fans at the Checker Dome in St. Louis. King Kong Brody the challenger, referee Lee Warren. The instructions before the match begins. Two out of three falls, one hour time limit. Flair with that gaudy robe. What a sight he was coming into the ring. The gold belt. Think of the history behind that gold belt. You can trace it all the way back to 1900. To people like Frank Gotch and George Hackenschmidt and through Strangler Lewis and to Luthez, certainly. Whipper Billy Watson. Gene Kaniski, Wild Bill Longson, Pat O'Connor, Harley Race. And now into the match, it's Brody with a flying tackle, levels Flair a few minutes into the start of the match. Brody hoists Flair into the air with one arm, body slam, driving Flair right into the center of the canvas. And Flair says, let me out of here, that one hurt. Referee Lee Warren keeping order as Ric Flair 
Buying some time outside the ring. You know the early moments of this match will be a feeling out process. Touching, testing, seeing what's strong, what's weak, what, what way is he thinking, what's he looking for, what am I looking for, what can I attack. Right there, Brody certainly made a very strong statement that he had the power. That big body slam following a flying tackle and flare taking as much time as he can outside the ring. Here was always the champion's advantage. Remember, the challenger has to win the championship. The challenger has to win the matchup. Draw is as good as a victory as far as the champion's concerned because he keeps the gold belt. So Flair is going to be a little cautious, but that's not the nature of Ric Flair. Ric Flair's nature is to gamble, to take chances. Will he take chances against somebody like King Kong Brody? They lock up in the center of the ring. Side headlock over the hip by Ric Flair. Head scissors by King Kong Brody. Brody with those powerful legs squeezing the head of Flair, and Flair can't kick out. King Kong Brody with those powerful legs right across the cheekbone and the chin of Ric Flair. Look at him push the power, push the strength, push the weight of his legs into the side of Flair's face, balancing up on his feet, twisting the head. Lee Warren right in there to check if Flair wants to give up. Of course, I don't think anybody would expect that to happen there, but the referee's job still is to ask. How did King Kong Brody develop those powerful legs? Believe me, I've seen it happen many times with him in both gyms, even in hotel rooms. Thousands and thousands of squats, sometimes with weights, sometimes even without weights. He was very concerned about flexibility. He would work the squats over and over and over. You can see why Ric Flair's trapped in there, literally trapped by the head scissors. Look where the knee is, right underneath the cheekbone, King Kong Brody. He's not going to rush into it either. And while we talked about the advantage the champion has because he has to be beaten, keep in mind this, it's a one-hour match. And King Kong Brody knew he had cardiovascular conditioning and well, I won't say in his favor because Flair, that was also one of his strengths too, but Brody had no doubt he could go the length of time. Flair coming out with a headlock and Brody puts him right back in the head scissors. Excellent wrestling by King Kong Brody. Again, balancing up on one foot, put extra pressure in the neck. Anything you can do to make the man hurt somewhere, make a weakness, because he'll have to compensate. And when he compensates, that means there's an opening. King Kong Brody with the head scissors. Flair really locked down to the mat, but look, he's still always careful, trying to stay off his back, keeping the shoulder up, trying to twist around once more as he did the headstand before and came out with the headlock. But look where Brody's hands are, right behind Flair's head. Flair feels that pressure, the referee cautioning Brody stay out of the tights, Flair balancing, trying to get the balance but he can't get the leverage he needs simply because of the simple fact, look where, well, look where his head is, you can see it popping out on the other side of Brody's knees, but that was all because of the pressure Brody was applying to the back of the head. Flair however, off the ring general rolling to the ropes, the referee not too impressed, that's not clearly entangled in the ropes. Flair decides that won't work and he's still stuck in the head scissors of King Kong Brody. Flair, a former football player at the University of Minnesota before he went into wrestling, trained by the great Vern Gagne. Part of the class that Gagne trained, one of his teammates when Gagne was training young wrestlers was also Ken Patera. Now Flair starting to pop that head out, the head's starting to come out, now it's Flair who has some leverage. He's bending down on the ankles and Brody gives up the head scissors. He's out, but Brody kicking away. There's the strength of that of millions and millions of squats as Flair catapulted across the ring. Brody right on top of him, the crowd screamed. They're waiting for the volcano to explode. Lee Warren trying to keep order. Brody with an arm whip across the ring into the corner. Back body drop. Flair sailing high in the air in the checker dome before he crashes to the mat and then a kick to the head by King Kong Brody. Flair trying to come up and Brody with another boot right to the side of the face of Ric Flair. A punch to the stomach by Ric Flair. That slows up Brody. Headbutt to the stomach by Ric Flair. And then a very simple thing, just gouging the eye, and that takes a little of the balance, a little of the momentum away from King Kong Brody, trying to find his way around that ring, blinded momentarily, but lashes out with a boot. Right now it's a slugfest between Flair and Brody. Flair with an elbow to the top of Brody's head. And he pitches Brody through the ropes and out of the ring to the floor of the Shekinah. But look at Brody stomping around the ring, angrily crawling back in. Do you want to play that way in that crowd? Standing, 
standing, screaming. Now it's Flair who bailed out when it's Brody in the ring. Remember how that sequence started? It was Flair who threw Brody out. It ends up with Flair jumping out because Brody was on the warpath. And you can bet that Ric Flair, who lost that little test of wills right there, is going to use a full 20 count outside the ring. In different states at that time, back in 1983, there were different counts outside the ring. Illinois actually had a count of 10. In Missouri, it was 20. It varied from state to state, and that, of course, made it even harder on the top-line wrestlers because they were traveling all over the country. They had to remember slight rule changes, different things that would cause disqualifications. It was always a little bit different. It was always a test, a test, a challenge for the people inside the ring. Knee to the stomach. Big chop to the throat by Ric Flair. Flair, grabbing the hair, slams Brody head first into the top turnbuckle. Brody sagging to the mat. Flair pounds right on the forehead of Rick. Rick Flair right on the forehead of Brody. Rick Flair again pounding on Brody's forehead. Brody brought, brought to his feet by Flair. Arm whip. Elbow right underneath the chin. Brody was able to elude part of it and take it lower down on the chest where it might not cause as much damage. Whoop, whip reversed. Bear hug by King Kong Brody. The bear hug by Brody again. A power move by a power wrestler. King Kong Brody. He wore in checking. And for those fans who've been around, well, more than a few years, you might remember Yukon Eric. Back in the early 1950s, up through the early 1960s, it was the bear hug he'd use to win his matches. He'd squeeze a concession out of his opponent or cause them simply to become unconscious because he squeezed all the wind out. But Brody is looking for here. Oh, his Flair tries to go for the eye. Lee Warren trying to get a look, but Lee right now is a little bit shorter than the two wrestlers. I don't know if he can see the face of Brody. Brody bent over. Brody was trying to use that bear hug to take the wind out of Flair, just to take some of the stamina away. Both men a little groggy at the moment. Brody because his eye was gouged. Flair because he's trying to get some wind back. Flair though, quickly to the attack. He doesn't want to pass up an opportunity to be on front of Brody. Going for the suplex. Going for the suplex and Brody blocks it. Going for the suplex again. Brody blocks it. Brody was also a tough man to slam. Came, claimed that nobody could body slam him or suplex him. Flair couldn't do it there. But oh, look at this. Brody with a suplex on Flair. Flair tried the suplex, failed. Brody tried the suplex, and he scored with the suplex. Again, that crowd screaming. Brody lining him up, going to the air for a quick stop on the head of Ric Flair. The crowd was simply, simply dynamite that night at the Checkerdome. I remember it well. And even Ric Flair would tell you today it was one of his most favorite matches, one of his most favorite moments in wrestling because the St. Louis crowd was so intense, so filled with energy and excitement. It was like electricity inside that building. Herb Simmons, who's helped produce all these wrestling at the chase and classic St. Louis wrestling shows. Herb was at the card and he's always told me too. He said, I just couldn't sit. I could hardly sit down. It was just so exciting to be in that building. It was just like electricity throughout the crowd, all 16,765. Flair and Brody again going at it toe to toe. Brody knocked back into the corner by Flair. Flair grabbing the arm, trying the arm whip. Nope, Brody won't come. Brody won't come. He's hanging onto the rope. Flair can't pull him out of that corner. Trying, trying. Well, we'll take the chop to the throat and see if that works. No, Brody like the arch. Look at the balance he has, those legs spread. And Flair says, let me think about this. Again, a test of wills between Brody and Flair. Something that Flair generally was able to do to an opponent he could not do to King Kong Brody right there in that instance. And it shakes him. It rattles him. It has to. He goes to the body slam, the body slam, but Flair, Flair can't get him up. Flair couldn't get Brody up, but Brody again, he gets Flair into the air. Walks halfway across the ring, look at him, high into the air. Oh, big body slam by King Kong Brody. Once more, Flair foiled. First he tried to slam Brody, couldn't do it, and then Brody slammed Flair. Flair quick to kick out at the count of one by Lee Warren. Front face lock by King Kong Brody. Simple hold, rest hold, hardly. Simple ones hurt the most. Ask anybody, ask Luthez, ask Pat O'Connor, ask Harley Race, ask any of the guys who've been around this business for any length of time, ask Ric Flair. How hard was it to breathe 
for Ric Flair right there. Brody's not strangling, but think of how he's pinching the cheeks together. Leaning into him, bending his chin up into his own chest. Also now on top of 280 plus pounds on top of Flair's body as he tries to keep his shoulders up. Think of this the tremendous strain on the spine, on the neck of Ric Flair as King Kong Brody leans on him, uses his full weight. Again, trying to take some of the stamina away from Ric Flair. Balancing up Lee Warren right there. Talk about good referee work. You talk about good referee work. Belly down, Joe Schoenberger. The great referee from St. Louis who was there on January the 7th, 1966, when Gene Kaniski dethroned Luthez for the World Heavyweight title at Kiel Auditorium. Joe Schoenberger taught Lee and his brother Ed Warren refereeing. And one thing he always stressed was belly down. When a guy's got his shoulders down to the mat, you got to be down to the mat too. Your belly's got to be down so you can see both those shoulders. And Lee Warren did a textbook example of it right there. Shoulder blast to the stomach by Flair. Another chop to the throat. That's also been a staple of Flair's attack. Flair, flying mare, Brody down. Now it's Flair clamping the head of Brody, using some of Brody's own, own, own intentions on Brody, some of Brody's own strategy. Look where the elbows are. Either side of the cheekbone, pinching the mouth together, forcing Brody to try to breathe through his nose. Now they've already been in here 15 minutes. You know you're puffing and having trouble breathing right now. Think when your mouth is being squeezed together, it not only hurts, but it's hard to breathe. And that's what Ric Flair is trying to do to Brody. Really, both have probably recognized by this point that stamina was going to be the key part of this match. Who'd break first? Who'd run out of gas first? So part of the problem right now is try to slow the guy down, try to make him breathe hard, try to take some of his stamina away. Flair right back down, squeezing that head, squeezing the cheeks together. Ric Flair leaning on him. Look where his chest is. It's into the back, the neck of King Kong Brody. Brody reaching up for the hair. Lee Warren stopped him. Flair turning that head. King Kong Brody. Able at least to get his mouth open there, but you can see how the nose is pinched off. Now the whole face is contorted by Ric Flair as the champion. Applies this. Really, it's a face lock as much as anything. They're one of the many cameras at ringside. Almost 17,000 people at the famous checkered room, also known as the arena in St. Louis. Think of the history that went through that building. That was one of Sam Muchnick's first sellouts at the arena for Buddy Rogers, wrestling Luthez. He had a record crowd there many years ago, back in the 50s. Now it's Flair, He's the Buddy Rogers of his era, with an elbow drop on King Kong Brody. Brody kicks Flair off, Flair right back to the head. Right back to the head, squeezing, squeezing, squeezing. Brody kicking, he knows he doesn't want to be trapped down there. No matter how big, no matter how big, how strong, how tough you are, if you can't breathe, if you're gasping for wind, you're vulnerable. And it only takes a count of three to get a pin. Could be a small package, could be a front rolling cradle, could be a little sunset flip. You never know how that pin's going to come. And there, once again, putting the shoulders down. You never know, you might get lucky. Look at Lee Warren right in there again. Look how his head is. Look where he is, right? Look at those shoulders. King Kong Brody struggling to keep the shoulders up as Lee Warren's right in there. And Flair hoping he can catch a lucky break. You never know when lightning will strike. Ric Flair. Leaning into Brody, Brody struggling to come up. A real test. A test of more than just physical skill. It's a test of who wants it. Who's got the most guts? King Kong Brody or Ric Flair? Flair staying on top of him. He's probably hooked the arm on the far side now. Yes, he has a little bit. But Brody so strong, trying to come up. Fans intent. They've not often seen King Kong Brody wrestle to the mat like Ric Flair just did. Brody trying to fight back. Flair pounding on the back. Brody pounds in the stomach. Chop again to the throat. Ric Flair. Side headlock. Off the ropes comes Brody. Flying tackle levels the world champion. Over the top. Leapfrog by the world champion. Hip toss and down goes Brody. Ric Flair backing up. Coming for the elbow drop and he misses as Brody rolls away. Just when it looked like Flair had something going, Brody bounces back, avoids the flying elbow drop and vicious, vicious kicks to the head by King Kong Brody. Brody, another boot right to the head. You think that there are cobwebs in Ric Flair's head right now, Brody going up on the ropes so he can come down and assault 
The world heavyweight champion, big chop right to the top of the noggin. And Flair goes down. Flair in trouble here. He opened up the attack and now he's paying the price. He opened it up. He opened up the offense and it's Brody coming back. Oh, big forearm smash. Look at Lee Warren point. That was the forearm. Worse than the fist. That big forearm bone to the cheek. But Flair, he never quits. We all know that. Flying tackle, it doesn't work. Brody levels him. He was leaning forward so he caught him with the shoulder. Flair tries again. Walks right into it. Walks right into it. A big body slam by King Kong Brody. Oh, he lines him up. Flair, look out below. The giant flying knee drop. Flair crushed to the mat by King Kong Brody. The crowd standing. They sense it. Count of one, two, three. There's the first fall. The first fall belonging to King Kong Brody. The crowd standing, screaming. Will they see the title change hands tonight? On February the 11th, 1983 at the Checkerdome, will the title change hands tonight? Will King Kong Brody become the champion? The winner of the first fall, King Kong Brody! King Kong Brody realizing he's on the edge of realizing a dream could that moment be here something he always wanted could Ric Flair be on the verge of defeat could the world heavyweight championship when it still meant something be ready to change hands and Ric Flair going wow I'm in a lot of trouble down one fall to none He's taken a tremendous giant flying knee drop and foiled in many of the moves he tried to make. The funny thing was at one point Flair was in control when he was able to get Brody off his feet and wrestle him. Flair was in control there, but once he made the mistake of opening up the offense, it was Brody's offense that took charge. An interesting match as you look at it too because in some ways you're seeing different things than you would expect from these two people. And I think looking back to it and having talked to both Brody and Flair in intervening years, I think there was so much respect both ways between Ric Flair and King Kong Brody for what each one could do well. It almost intimidated the other man where he held back just a little bit for fear of making a mistake like that one where Brody ran into the knee lift right into the stomach. I think they were both afraid of making the big mistake. And maybe that slowed them up, made them a little bit more cautious than normal. Flair throwing Brody outside the ring. Now grabbing him by the hair. Brody grabbing Flair's ankles. Flair afraid to let go because if he does, he's coming outside the ring with Brody in control of his legs. We don't want that if you're, you're Ric Flair. Flair takes Brody into the top rope, jerks it down into his throat, almost like a judo chop. And now Brody gasping for a bit of win. Ric Flair has to win a fall. He's down one fall to none. He knows now the pressure's on him. The shoe is definitely on the other foot. Flair punishing the windpipe of, Rick, of, of King Kong Brody. Again, breathing, stamina becoming so important. Flair grabbing the arm. Ooh, a punch right into the short rib. Again, attacking that side, the ribs. Trying to hurt Brody where every man, no matter how strong, no matter how many muscles he has, they're vulnerable there. Brody caught in the corner by Ric Flair. Flair leaning into him, trying to stay close to him, trying to take away the size advantage that Brody has, the strength advantage. We talk about a strength advantage for King Kong Brody, sure, but let's not kid ourselves. That doesn't mean Ric Flair was weak. To the contrary, Ric Flair was a finely tuned athlete at the height of his skills right now as the world heavyweight champion. He hooks the arm, basic arm lock now, trying to punish the shoulder a little bit. Can he weaken? Even if it's only 5%, even if it's only 5%, can he weaken one side of King Kong Brody, where Brody would favor it and open up? Open up a spot where Flair could attack and perhaps get a pin to even this match at one fall apiece. Twisting the arm, turning the wrist, bending the hand back, anything to punish King Kong Brody. And once again here, just as in the first fall, Ric Flair, his wrestling ability coming to the forefront and creating a problem for King Kong Brody. Knee drop right into the elbow. 
Now here's a story most people don't know about King Kong Bowie. Probably about this point in his career was when that left elbow of Brody was actually broken. He had a hairline fracture in the elbow he never took time off for because this is professional wrestling. You don't get to go on the disabled list. You don't keep making $10 million a year when you're sitting at home cutting your fingernails. You have to work if you want to make money. Brody's left elbow had a lot of punishment over the years, and by the time before he passed away in 1988, I would guess in early 87, he showed me how his left hand had basically developed what they call claw fingers. The feeling had come out of the ring finger and the little finger. He couldn't move it. And that was because of all of the punishment of wrestling. And here was Flair, working on that left arm. He knew that a lot of the bumps that Brody took, because Brody was willing to take to the air with drop kicks and the giant flying knee drop, a lot of that also meant landing on that elbow pointed down there. So that elbow had to be sore and hurting. And Brody also admitted over a period of time, that's obviously what caused that elbow bone to crack. He knew had he lived, he was looking at an elbow replacement somewhere probably in the early 90s. Flair pulling back on the arm, a classic double arm lock. Looks like Johnny Valentine there, doesn't he? Pulling back on that arm. Ric Flair pulling back on the arm, trying to punish King Kong Brody. And again, the wrestling skill of Flair paying off for him. Brody never made any bones about it. He never considered himself a great scientific wrestler. He got by on power, brute strength, and simple will. He wasn't going to quit. He had a big, as big a heart as anybody inside that ring. There's Flair rubbing the bone of his knee into the bone of, Fla of Brody's elbow. Is that Flair's, a, Flair's knee into Brody's elbow? Let's get that straight. Charlie Regal and Herb Simpson keeping an eye on here, me here to make sure I do this right. Where's Mickey Garagiola when you need him? He's probably smoking a cigar. Ooh, look at the punishment on that arm. Look at Flair using the leverage to punish the arm of King Kong Brody. Brody stretched back. Look how the shoulders almost pull out of the socket. Flair leaning into 245 pounds of Ric Flair. A tremendous punishment into that elbow of King Kong Brody. Bending back with him, looking for the ropes for a little extra leverage. Did Lee Warren catch him? Yes, he did. He caught Flair using the ropes for some extra leverage. A kick into the rib by Ric Flair. Brody fighting back. Push to the corner, push to the ropes rather by Ric Flair. Flair staying in tight to him. The referee trying to separate them again. Flair leery of giving Brody too much room. He's got his arm tied over the top rope. Finally chased back. Oh no, it's Brody who has a hold of Flair's nose. Brody with a nose lock and then a forearm right across the forehead of Ric Flair. Flair fighting back. He does want to lose the advantage he has. But Brody, knowing a lot's at stake here, he just gouges the eyes. No bones about it. This is a clawing, fighting, scratching moment in professional wrestling inside that checker dome ring. The World Heavyweight Championship at stake. King Kong Brody with the first and thus far only fall. Again, gouging the face, twisting the nose of Ric Flair. Brody knew he was getting into trouble and he was going to stop it. Clawing away at each other, knowing the stakes. We sat down and tried to figure out the payday. Let's talk about it a little bit in the book Wrestling at the Chase. We talked about the payoff Sam Muchnikov's had. The main event got 8% of the growth, so this match alone was probably worth ten dollars to $12,000 to these two men. But think how much more it was worth to be the world heavyweight champion. Think how much more it was worth to have 10 pounds of gold around your waist. Multiply 10,000 or 12,000 a hundred times, and then maybe you have the answer. Brody down on top of Flair, he was biting him. Brody tossing caution away. He knew he wasn't going to be able to wrestle with Flair. He would have to make Flair wrestle his match, which was a brawl. And here we are outside the ring. Flair trying to get away from Brody. Brody stalking him. Flair rolling back in. Can he get there? Brody bringing him back out on the floor. King Kong Brody up one fall to none, going after the world heavyweight champion. Chip and he slams Flair. Flair got his shoulder up, blocking his head at least from hitting the steel ring post. Flair trying to stay away from Brody outside the ring. This is not where you want to be with King Kong Brody in no man's land outside the squared circle. Brody squeezing Flair's arms around the steel ring post trying to punish that shoulder. He'll take advantage of any edge he can get. Flair tries to fight back though. Brody and Flair both back inside the ring. 
Brody hits the ropes. Oh, a big kick to the stomach. Flair was expecting a flying tackle. Instead, he got the boot into the belly. Right into the bread basket by King Kong Brody. And then Brody walks into a vicious elbow right underneath the chin. A knockout punch from Ric Flair. A knockout elbow from Ric Flair and then driving the knee down across the forehead of Brody. A favorite, favorite Flair move. The knee drop to the forehead of King Kong Brody. Flair trying to follow up his advantage. They come to their feet. Trying to arm whip Brody out of that corner. It's not easy. Brody reverses the whip. Oh, and Flair hits the shoulder and bicep that went into the steel ring post. And now Brody begins chopping on the shoulder and arm of Ric Flair. Any opening you get, you have to take advantage. This is for all the marbles. This is it. There's nothing higher than this that you can fight for. So you'll scratch and claw. And you'll break the rules if you have to. Whoa, knee drop missed. Knee drop missed. Knee drop for Flair's head missed. Flair going for the pile driver. Flair going for the pile driver. Can he get him up? No, look at the balance that Brody has. Brody taking the leverage away from Flair, lifting, oh, oh, look at that, dead body weight. All in the neck, think of the strength that took. Flair wasn't jumping, he was lifted by King Kong Brody with his neck and flipped over the top when Flair tried a pile driver. To the ropes goes Flair. Drop kick by King Kong Brody, a man that size, 6'5", 285 pounds. He used to weigh 320, but he trimmed down by this point in his career knowing that speed and stamina were so important against opponents like Ric Flair. Still, what a feat to get in the air for a drop kick like that against Ric Flair. Flair with his foot on the ropes. There'll be no pin there. It's not going to be two straight falls for King Kong Brody. Brody didn't realize that Flair's foot was on the ropes. Lee Warren trying to explain it to him. And that's not the easiest thing to do if you're inside the ring and you have almost 17,000 people screaming. It's hard to hear each other. Even if the guys right there say his foot was on the ropes and Brody's probably saying, what, what? Brody pounds Flair to the corner. It looks like the tide has turned a little bit. Brody more in charge now, but Flair fighting back with a boot. Ooh, and it knocks Brody through the ropes and onto the floor. Lee Warren beginning the 20 count. It's 10 on the apron, 20 on the floor. Brody on the floor of the checker dome. Coming back in, Flair right there to greet him. And it's not a friendly greeting. Going for the suplex. Going for the suplex on King Kong Brody again. Brody blocks the suplex. Once more, Flair foiled as he tries to use the suplex on King Kong Brody. And that would have been devastating if he could have done it there. Whoa, he misses a punch. And Brody fights back. Brody furiously pounding on Ric Flair. Brody on Flair. Flair staggered. Throws a wild punch. Both men back off a bit. And then a kick from Brody pushes Flair back into the corner. Not pretty, it's not pretty, it's vicious. It's sometimes crude, always rough, but it's vicious because the World Heavyweight Championship is at stake. King Kong Brody twisting the face of Flair as he mounted the rope so he could pound on Flair. Brody stumbled down, Flair may have landed a chop to the stomach as Brody was up there on the ropes. Flair grabbing Brody's hair, going for the suplex, going for the suplex. Oh, he got him up. He got him up. Ric Flair finally delivered the suplex to King Kong Brody. This could be it. The falls could be even. Kind of one, two, and oh, Brody kicks free. After all the times that Ric Flair tried with that suplex and couldn't do it, finally he electrifies the Checker Dome crowd by delivering the suplex to King Kong Brody, and Brody is shaken. Brody is shaken. That was nearly the evening fall. He came within a quarter of a count of making it one fall apiece. Elbow drop by Flair, trying for the pin. Count of two, count of, and Brody kicks out again. King Kong Brody hurt after Flair delivered the suplex. Flair going behind him, pulling the hair back. What does Flair have in mind? Going for the abdominal stretch. The abdominal stretch on King Kong Brody. Not an easy hold to get on somebody like Brody because of the strength, the length of his body. Once upon a time, back in the 50s and 60s, this was a killer, a killer submission hold for a gentleman by the name of Wilbur Snyder, who ought to be in the Hall of Fame of Wrestling if he isn't. Wilbur Snyder popularized the abdominal stretch. By now, a lot of people knew that flexibility was a key, and certainly Brody was one of the first big men to realize it. 
And that's why the abdominal stretch here is not getting a submission because Brody worked constantly on flexibility, just as Flair did. Flair perhaps not realizing how much effort Brody put into that, and the abdominal stretch perhaps not as effective as Flair thought it would be on King Kong Brody. He thought Brody was hurting after that suplex, and he probably still is, and this puts pressure in the same place as the suplex rattled. But now the abdominal stretch, he can't get the submission. He can't get the submission from King Kong Brody. Lee Warren's right there to check it. Brody, what's he doing? Is he trying to move out of it? Yeah, he's getting that top arm free. Brody moving behind Flair. And he has the opposite arm of Flair. Oh, what do we have here? It's Brody reversing the abdominal stretch under Ric Flair. Ric Flair now, he's the one trapped in the abdominal stretch by King Kong Brody. It's not exactly textbook by Brody, but it's an abdominal stretch and he's twisting Flair pretty successfully. Not enough to get a submission, not quite. He can't quite get underneath him, but from Brody's standpoint, what he's done, he's escaped the suplex that nearly pinned him. He's escaped the abdominal stretch that caused him trouble. He's dodged a bullet and he's still up one fall to none over Ric Flair. Two falls out of three for the world heavyweight championship. Both men starting to feel the effects of this match now. We're nearly at 40 minutes into the match. Think of the energy, think of the conditioning that's being tested here between Flair and Brody. Flair getting right on top of him. Flair's had his best success when he stayed on top of him and Brody couldn't use his longer arms and his longer legs and couldn't unleash all of his violence onto Ric Flair. Brody pushed into the corner by Flair. Flair strangling Brody. Making no bones about it, he's willing to work the count of five before disqualification. He breaks at four. Five would be a disqualification. Lee Warren and Ric Flair toe to toe, nose to nose. Flair on top of Brody. Grabbing him by the throat again. He's going to work that count as far as he can. Warren trying to break him up because now Brody's strangling Flair. Both men strangling each other. You talk about going for everything you can. Oh, hang him high. Hang him high by King Kong. Brody shades of Big Bill Miller right there as he lifted Flair by the throat and flung him across the ring like a sack of potatoes. Flair made the mistake of going into the power matchup with Brody, and that never worked. Big forearm smashes right onto the chest of Flair. Quick try for a pin by Brody, but Flair, hey, he was down for two. You never know. You never know. Flair trying to come to his feet, frustrated, surely at this point, because when he got that suplex, he had to think, oh, this is it. I have Brody going for the pile driver. Brody looking for the pile driver. Flair trying to scoot to the ropes and get away. Oh, yes, Flair knew one thing he didn't want there was to have his head driven into that checkered old mat. That could have been curtains for Ric Flair and his reign as world heavyweight champion. Again, toe to toe, Flair and Brody, Flair and Brody. Brody pushing Flair towards the ropes. Trying to use his power on him, whipping him across the ring. Oh, Flair nearly catapulted it over the top rope. Hung out to dry like Monday morning's wash. Ric Flair upside down, hanging in the corner. Hanging in the corner, vulnerable for Brody. Driving both forearms right into the ribs of Ric Flair. Oh, now it's Flair. Flair in deep. Deep trouble, down one fall to none. He can't lose this fall. And Brody's going to try to punish Flair. And Flair is going to try to hang onto those ropes and stay in that corner. The last place Ric Flair wants to be right now is in the middle of the ring, where he can't get to the ropes to break a potential count of three. Brody bringing Flair up. You can see the match taking its toll on both men now. We're well at the 40 minute mark. Elbow smash to the head of Ric Flair. Look how good of a ring general Flair is, though, as he tried to stay by the ropes, but now Brody realizes it cuts him off from the ropes, and Flair is forced to back up into the middle of the ring. Not where he wanted to be. Not where Ric Flair wanted to be as Brody bangs on the head. Brody with another smash to the head of Ric Flair. Flair taking his lumps at the hands of King Kong Brody. Flair, oh. Can he come up? And Brody's got to be thinking right now, if I could land one more big knee, one more big knee, that gold belt's going around my waist. Flair groggy throws a wild punch and misses again. 
He's knocked in the corner, jumps out of the ring, just simply going for the eyes of Brody. Desperation right there by the World Heavyweight Championship, trying to keep his reign alive. Brody lifting Flair, one more big body slam, throwing him far away from his body. How many body slams has Flair taken in this match? Six, seven, eight? Think they don't take a call, the big knee drop, he misses! Brody missing the knee drop. Flair having enough attention to roll away and Brody misses the knee drop. How often did you ever see that? Brody was so good, so good at sensing when his opponent was vulnerable for that knee drop. He was wrong there. He was wrong because Ric Flair was able to pull a rabbit out of the hat and get away from the flying knee drop of King Kong Brody. Brody. Now he's the one in real trouble. How often did he miss that? And that knee has to be aching, throbbing. And it came down and Flair goes right to the attack. Ric Flair viciously going after King Kong Brody. Brody by the ropes. He could buy some time outside the ring now. Look at him hobbling on that leg, stretching out, trying to stretch out the cramps in the hamstring of the quadriceps. That hurt Brody as much as the guy underneath it would have been crushed. Brody, grabbed by the hair, pulled to the apron by Ric Flair. Oh, into the turnbuckle by Ric Flair. Again, Flair slamming the head into the turnbuckle. Two things have been proven here so far. Number one, Brody was able to withstand a good scientific wrestler and still hang in there. He hasn't lost a fall. He's up one fall to none, and Ric Flair has proven beyond any shadow of a doubt. He's one tough cookie. Flair standing with Brody. Flair and Brody again. Maybe the fifth or sixth time in this match. Flair and Brody toe to toe, battling it out. Neither man willing to give an inch, but it's Brody taking command with big forearms and punches. Flair leaned into the ropes. An uppercut by Brody and Flair knocked clear over the top rope and down to the floor. An uppercut by Brody. Almost that European style uppercut that Dory Funk Jr. used to use. Brody going out after Flair. Flair trips Brody. Flair and Brody outside the ring. Flair and Brody on the floor of the checkered home. A chop to the throat. Flair and Brody battling once more. Neither man willing to give an inch. Flair crawling to the apron, the referee making the count on both men. It's 20 because they're on the floor. A count of 20 on both Flair and Brody. They're up on the apron. Flair and Brody, the count's still going on. Flair lands a chap, Brody lands a punch. They're trading blows back and forth. Flair pounding on Brody. Brody ducks beneath Flair, backdrops him to get away from him. Tumbles off the apron. The referee making the count. He's calling for the bell. When did he get to 20? Obviously, when Brody was still outside the ring and Flair had been catapulted inside the ring. Let's get that official announcement as Lee Warren explains to me exactly why he did what he did. In 22 minutes and 40 seconds, at the count of 18, Ric Flair was back in the ring. But King Kong Brody was still outside at the count of 20. Therefore, Brody is counted out outside the ring, and the winner of the second fall is Rick Flair. Rick Flair has even the match at one fall apiece. One fall apiece, almost a fluke. A mistake, I guess some could say, but as they furiously battled on the apron, Brody did what was logically, ducked underneath and flipped the man up into the air. King Kong Brody realizing now it was a mistake, but not a mistake that he really made. It's one of those things that happen when you have a showdown between two of the greatest athletes, two of the greatest competitors in the history of the business. That time it worked in Ric Flair's advantage. Ric Flair wins the second fall as Brody is counted out outside the ring. One fall apiece, one fall apiece. Brody knows what he has to do. He needs to win this fall to become the world heavyweight champion. He needs this fall. Flair, he'd like a win, he'd like a pin. 
But he's settled for staying alive too because he still have the gold belt. He takes a few more of those forearms in the head though. He won't be staying anywhere except in an ambulance on the ride to the hospital. Brody with his boot underneath the jaw. Digging, digging on Ric Flair, the world champion. Flair. So exhausted that he was able to come up with that big fall that he desperately needed to tie this match at one fall apiece. Brody again, trying to punish the windpipe of Ric Flair. Flair, gasping, but he's still staying by the ropes. Brody wants to get him out of that corner, but he wants to punish him too. King Kong Brody in that position now where you want to do 20 different things at the same time. You want to slam him, you want to pull him, you want to punch him, you want to kick him, you want to get him in the middle, you want to strangle him over the ropes. The hardest part now is controlling yourself mentally, emotionally. That crowd screaming, screaming, screaming. Wanting more, wanting to see the title change, it's funny. Even when the world champion was a popular figure, in the days of a Luthez, of a Pat O'Connor, of a Dory Funk Jr., there came a time when everybody wants to see that title change. It didn't happen very often back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Not like today where it happens every other week. So it meant something, it meant something. Dory Funk Jr. had a four and a half year reign as the world heavyweight champion. Harley Race had a four year reign as the world heavyweight champion. Jack Briscoe had the title over two years. It meant something and the belt changed hands. And St. Louis, over the years, was blessed by seeing many title changes. I guess the last two before that were Kaniski over Thez. And then in 1959, Pat O'Connor over Dick Hutton. Flair pitches Brody to the ropes. Flying tack. Ooh, good bounce there. Here comes Brody again. Flair looking for the sleeper hold. Something he never was really known for. But something he knew the rudiments of, the basics of anything right now to slow down Brody, to eat up some time, that's what Ric Flair wanted. He squeezes with the sleeper hold. He squeezes with the sleeper hold. If he can get the right leverage and put Brody out, all the better. But this has a two-fold purpose for a KG ring general like Ric Flair. Flair with that sleeper trying to take away from the clock, trying to take away from what's left of the energy of King Kong Brody. After this match, Brody told me, he says it was, he told me it was three days until he felt like a human being. He says every muscle hurt the next morning. He says, and I know Flair felt the same way. And Lee Warren said, I lost close to 10 pounds sweating in that ring, jumping up and down, belly down, trying to count, trying to stay on top of the action, and trying not to get trampled by these two guys. Brody, Leaning forward, look how Flair, look where that shoulder is. Pushing into the head, pushing the chin down. Once again, we talk about the subtle little movements in wrestling, trying to take the ability to breathe away from your opponent. Ric Flair is doing that without a strangle. The real pressure is on the side of the neck, just where a sleeper hold should be, trying to cut the blood flow off. Of course, Brody's neck was about as big as a telephone pole, so that's not the easiest thing to do. Flair with the sleeper hold. Brody, still very much in it, but feeling some of the effects. Trying to keep the blood flow right there, just moving his hands, moving his arms. Trying to keep alive, knowing he has to break out of this. He needs this fall. He needs this fall, and there's one way to do it. He ran towards the corner and rammed Flair right into the top turnbuckle. Flair hung on to the last second when he realized that the superior weight of Brody was pulling him towards the corner. It was almost too late to move. But he still has the advantage. Flying mare by Ric Flair. Staggers to the corner. Goes for an elbow drop that misses. The elbow drop misses by Flair. Is this Brody's opening? Flair coming up quickly though. Misses with a roundhouse. And then it's Brody trying to squeeze the head of Flair. I don't know how much Brody knew about the sleeper hold. But he knew if you squeeze a man's blood supply to his brain, you might be able to make him pass out. And basically, he's just squeezing the neck as hard as he can right there. It's brutish, it's powerful, but it's effective as Brody squeezes, squeezes, squeezes the neck of Ric Flair. And Flair goes down to one knee. Maybe he can get on top of him. Maybe he can wear him down. You look back at some of the great title matches over history, sometimes they end on very quick pins on things that people would never have expected. Just very simple things, body press, if they could catch the right leverage and catch the right moment. Now you're looking at a match that's gone 50 minutes, well over 50 minutes they've been in that ring. Let me tell you, nobody's ready to go out dancing right now. Brody on top and trying to push the shoulders down, and Ric Flair. <laughs> so smart. 
saw that rope there, let Brody feel good about it, and then Ric Flair drops his boot on the bottom rope, and Lee Warren has to call for a break. Brody rolls away from Flair. If they respected each other before they were in the ring against each other, how much respect do you think they had for each other after they knocked heads for almost an hour? Ric Flair and King Kong Brody. Flair trying to get his win back. Brody trying to make that brain click, click, click. What can I do? What can I do to break this man? What can I do to knock him off the throne? Again, basic hard wrestling. Body slam one more time trying to wear Flair down. Lining him up. Oh, going for the leg drop, the guillotine leg drop rather than the big knee drop. That probably says something right there that Brody didn't go for the knee drop. He went for the guillotine leg drop. Flair goes for the figure four. Flair going for the figure four leg lock on King Kong Brody because he realized when Brody didn't go for the knee drop, that meant his knee was hurting. He's vulnerable and Ric Flair knew it. Flair right to the figure four leg lock. When Brody didn't go for the flying knee drop, Ric Flair, so smart, he realized that King Kong Brody's knee was vulnerable and here's Flair with the figure four leg lock. Can he get a submission out of King Kong Brody? Can he put enough pain to make Brody lean back? Maybe let his shoulders inadvertently fall on the mat for a three count. Flair stretching, straining, trying to do everything he can to the ligaments, the meniscus in King Kong Brody's knee, but now Brody trying to roll Flair over. Brody trying to reverse it. King Kong Brody reversing the figure four leg lock. Can he take it over? Yes, and puts the pressure on Ric Flair. The pressure on Flair is Brody puts all that pressure into the leg of Ric Flair before Flair pops out of the hole and now both men, a little gimpy after the figure four leg lock, reversed and in its original position, has taken a toll on both Flair and Brody. Flair coming up on top of Brody and begins pounding, pounding, pounding on the head of King Kong Brody. Brody says, I can play that game better than any man alive. King Kong Brody on his feet, raining forearms down on the head of Flair, going for the pile driver. He couldn't get it before. Can he get the pile driver on Ric Flair this time? Yes, he's got him in the air. Look out below as Brody with the pile driver. Oh, ramming the neck and head of Flair into the mat, making sure he had all the leverage in the world as he tried to knock Flair's head right down into his shoulders. This could be at the count of one. Count of two, and no. Flair with his boot across the bottom rope. Brody sees it. He knows it. It was a good call. Here he finally got that pile driver, which he tried once earlier in the match, and Flair was able to scoot to the ropes. Elbow drop. Not something you often saw from Brody, but it's desperation time now. Desperation time now, and Brody taking any chance he can. Throwing that elbow and missing. Both men having trouble coming to their feet, trying to find a way. Flair with a chop. Arm whip. Brody to the ropes. Ducks. Comes off. Big boot. Right to the face of Ric Flair. Brody coming off with that signature. Big kick to the face. Another kick right to the solar plexus by Brody. Brody whipping him to the ropes. Another boot to the head. And Flair is down. Is he down for the count? Look at him fight. Look at him struggle to come back up after all that punishment from King Kong Brody. One more body slam. No, a backbreaker. A backbreaker. Shades of Gene Kaniski. The backbreaker. Beautifully delivered by Brody. Not even realizing where he is right now. They're close to the ropes. Flair didn't know he was that close either. And he kicked out. Not knowing he could have taken the easy way out. There's no room for error here. Flair. Looking maybe he could come down from the top on Brody. Who came to his feet slowly. But Brody's there waiting. Brody's there waiting with Flair. Sailing through the sky. Inside the checker dome. It's Ric Flair. Compliments of King Kong Brody. Brody, big forearm to the face. Brody, leery of going for that knee drop. Think back to that mix, that missed knee drop earlier and what a key part of the match that was. Brody obviously had hurt his knee and he was leery of going for the giant knee drop anymore, especially after the figure four leg lock. Flair was able to take one of the signature moves away from King Kong Brody. Brody going for the suplex on Flair. Time running out. Brody going for the suplex. He has him up in the air. Drives him down. Drives him down with the suplex. Going for the pin. Can he get there? Can he get there? 
No, the referee, the bell has sounded. The bell has sounded. One hour has expired as Flair and Brody went at each other. Hammer and Tong. And here it is. The one hour time limit expired with each man having won a fall. The match between King Kong Brody and Ric Flair is a draw. And Ric Flair retains the world heavyweight title. Ric Flair, still the champion. The gold belt going back to Flair on the night of that classic battle, Flair versus Brody. From Gorgeous George against Wild Bill Longson in 1950 to Ric Flair against King Kong Brody in 1983, St. Louis wrestling has always been something special. It has indeed been classic, but you already know that because you've been enjoying the volumes of classic St. Louis wrestling, each and every one, with something special, something you might remember for a lifetime. We're still digging, seeing if we can come up with more action, but right now let's enjoy what we have. It's been fun, and this special edition of classic St. Louis wrestling will be remembered for a long time. Thanks for watching. Off the ropes comes Brody. Flying tackle levels the world champion. Over the top. Leapfrog by the world champion. Hip toss and down goes Brody. Ric Flair backing up. Coming for the elbow drop and he misses as Brody rolls away. If you like classic St. Louis wrestling videos, you'll love the new book by Larry Matisic from ECW Press. Wrestling at the Chase, the inside story of Sam Muchnick and the legends of professional wrestling. Available now. What happened behind closed doors in St. Louis?